I'm Talia Ricci. Tonight, two people are found dead inside a Hamilton home. Shocked. Um, this is a holiday that you're supposed to be with family, and then that's not how you really wanted to spend Thanksgiving. What we know about the victims and the latest on the investigation into how they died. Plus... Oh, yeah! Oh, Great! Is, yeah, yeah, let it out, let it out! A major penalty on the Greens. We speak with the man who had racial slurs hurled at him at a golf course. And... For us, the biggest confusion is, is not knowing what, what the right thing to do is. That this idea of physical distancing indoors, it's fiction. As indoor dining shuts down in parts of Ontario, but not in others, we look at the risks of eating inside. Good evening and welcome to our viewers from across the province. Hamilton's Homicide Unit is investigating the deaths of two people tonight. Police were called to a home in the city's east end where they say the bodies of a male and female were found. Greg Ross has the latest. Police say they're treating the deaths of a man and a woman found in this home on Tregina Avenue South in Hamilton as suspicious. Residents say they were shocked to find their street had been shut down by police just after 8 o'clock last night. Just a bit surreal, just, you know, kind of taking everyone off guard and everyone's just kind of wondering, like, what happened. Just can't believe that happened uh, so close to home. People in the neighborhood say they believe an elderly woman lives in the home with her adult son, but that has not been confirmed by police. Neighbors describe them as friendly people. They seem like they're very kind and very nice people. So um, the, the mom was always outside and very social, very kind, very sweet. Like I said, we'd see them just out on their porch once in a while. and We, we, we keep to ourselves as well, so just, you know, never really talked to them much at all. The Hamilton Police Homicide Unit tells us they are still investigating the cause of death and are awaiting post-mortem examinations on the bodies. In the meantime, yellow police tape still surrounds the home here on what has turned into a very grim Thanksgiving weekend for residents on this street. This is a holiday that you're supposed to be with family. It's just uh, the cherry on top of a crazy year. Just, yeah, never would expect something like this. I don't think anybody ever really expects something like this in your neighborhoods. In an update on the Hamilton Police Twitter page, they say they are not looking for any additional individuals involved in these deaths. Greg Ross, CBC News, Hamilton. A Brampton man is speaking out after being on the receiving end of a racist incident on a golf course in Georgetown. Gersher Dillon was enjoying a round of golf with his friend on Saturday when he was called a racial slur during a confrontation with another golfer. As Kelda Yoon reports, video of this incident has since gone viral. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, you, right? there it is, yeah, yeah, let it out, let it out. The incident happened Saturday afternoon here at Georgetown Golf Club. Gersher Dillon says he and his friend were at the final hole when the family behind them started acting impatient. As I was about to hit my tee shot, the son said, oh, you better hit a good one. As I hit a good shot, I went to my friend. I said, is that good enough? Um, at this time, the, the father came out of the cart. What followed was a heated confrontation that included a racial slur directed at Dylan. Her, were you surprised that that happened? Uh, had that ever happened to you before? Yeah, and it actually was very surprising because, you know, my dad told me about all the stories when he uh, migrated here from India of him being called uh, a p And uh, when I was very young, um, in like elementary school, sometimes kids would say it because it was passed on from, from their parents. And it's been a long time since I've heard it now. Uh, and especially with the Black Lives Mo uh, Matters movement, uh, I was just astonished when he said it. Georgetown Golf Club and its owner, Clublink, have released a statement saying any incident involving racism will not be tolerated. And to this end, the individual in question who made the racist remarks has been expelled and banned from visiting any Clublink property. The mayor of Halton Hills also tweeted about the incident, calling it despicable and that he's glad the club took action. CBC News has reached out to the man seen in the video but hasn't heard back. Dylan says he's also glad the man has been banned but would also like to invite him out for a round of golf sometime. The fight against racism is a conversation. I can't just explicitly just say, oh, they did this and then, and then that's it. For him to join me on a golf course 
uh, 18 holes, four hours, I could tell him the lived experience of those marginalized community who've been oppressed for years and to really um, open up his eyes and open up his perspective. Club Link says Halton Regional Police were called and the club is assisting with the investigation. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. There was no Ontario COVID-19 update today due to Thanksgiving. Health officials are reminding people not to gather with anyone outside of your household for the holiday. The province saw its highest ever daily case count on Friday at more than 900. This weekend, those numbers were a little bit lower, but experts say that's to be expected after the government made COVID-19 testing by appointment only. Today's coronavirus case count will be posted tomorrow alongside Tuesday's numbers. A very different looking demonstration on the lawn of Queen's Park today. And it's just really important to continue to move for your mental health. So thank you so much everyone for joining. <laughs> yoga practitioners gathering at the legislature to raise concerns about the shutdown of yoga studios in parts of the province. The co-founder of a chain of studios says she doesn't understand why they've been targeted. She says her 13 locations were operating at reduced capacity and weren't the source of any known COVID-19 infections. Besides the effect on small businesses, she's also worried the closure will negatively impact mental health. We all gathered here to move because we're quite concerned about the shutdowns and the latest announcements from the government for specific regions. And so what we did here is we gathered together to really create that voice of the importance of moving, the importance of mental health, and the importance not to stop despite shutdowns and closures. As of this past Saturday, indoor dining, gyms, movie theaters, and casinos in a handful of regions are closed for a month in order to reduce the number of new daily COVID-19 infections. Those regions are Toronto, Peel, and Ottawa. And while indoor dining has been shut down in those hot spots, it is still available everywhere else in the province. With the colder months looming, Christine Bierak looks into the specific risks of eating inside a restaurant. When we gather indoors, several layers of protection against this virus disappear, especially when we eat. The thing about eating that's different is that you can mask for everything else, but when you have to eat, ultimately that mask has to come off. And what you don't see floating around in the air could make you sick. So we asked an indoor air quality expert to show us. Okay. You can't see the respiratory droplets that I'm making right now, but sure enough, I'm making them and they're going everywhere in this space. This device is picking them up. When I see that um, surging, uh, what, what is that indicating? That it's the diffuser like, mimics someone breathing. We're now seeing a cloud of up to 20,000 tiny particles. And it can go for meters and meters and meters. So I often say that this idea of physical distancing indoors, it's fiction. This study out of Hong Kong examined an outbreak at a windowless restaurant in China. Ten people from three different families were infected. Researchers concluded droplets of the virus were being pushed through the air by an air conditioning unit and infecting diners along the way. You could upgrade the filter to remove uh, particles and droplets that might contain the virus from the air. Um, but the, really the best thing to do is just to bring in more outdoor air. Many restaurant owners are trying to do just that, but feel it's a losing battle. For us, the biggest confusion is, is not knowing what, what the right thing to do is. You know, we open our front doors, we have the hoods going, we have air circulation and we're spraying and we're cleaning and we're wearing our masks and washing our hands. The virus doesn't spread through food, but doctors say gathering with others to eat carries another risk. Touching all those table settings, picking up the virus and inadvertently touching your face. So it really is important to think about risk in, in a few different ways. For many, gathering for a meal is a balancing act that is changing with the seasons. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. COVID-19 has impacted Toronto's most vulnerable communities, especially in the city's northwest. And with job losses and the need to feed families, many people are turning to the food bank. Past three months, we have seen a 75% increase uh, in demand for our uh, support compared to this time last year, which is, you know, which is really a huge surge. 
The North York Harvest Food Bank has seen a drastic increase in clients since the pandemic started. In July, they served a record of 760 households on one day alone, much higher than their average 100 households a day. The food bank's director says more clients are going to this food bank because other locations have closed down for financial reasons. And he expects things will get worse as winter approaches. 2008, when we saw a global recession, um, food bank usage didn't peak until uh, two years later in 2010. So as much as we've seen a surge in demand and as much as we see the difficulty that our community is facing, um, really the, the worst is probably uh, yet to come. So we have to brace for that as well. Community food drive pickups and drop-offs are on hold for the time being, but non-perishable food items and financial donations are still welcomed. A Toronto charity is not letting a pandemic get in the way of an important tradition, a Thanksgiving meal for hundreds of people in need. Very different from all the years. Uh, because of COVID, uh, things have changed so dramatically. And uh, the person on the street especially needs much more comfort, much more joy. So we're trying to do something very special uh, with Turkey and, uh, in, you know, all the works that we have. The Scott Mission served more than 300 Thanksgiving meals to those experiencing homelessness and food insecurity. But this year does look different. Shelter and kitchen staff were decked out in PPE and only 20 people are allowed to sit in their dining room at a time. The kitchen also prepared takeout turkey dinners, just another way for people to get a hot meal for the holidays. A nonprofit in Windsor, Essex County has been busy preparing and delivering Thanksgiving meals to 500 migrant workers this holiday weekend. Migrant workers do play a very important part in, in our um, community. Um, they are essential workers and um, they need to be recognized. About 1,200 migrant workers in the Windsor-Essex County region tested positive for the virus. Two died because of it. There were around 25 volunteers who helped cook and deliver the meals directly to the workers on farms in the area. The meals consisted of chicken, rice and coleslaw and options that workers are used to back home. Gift bags were also given to them along with $1,400 worth of gift cards from local businesses. 250 of the meals were delivered on Sunday and the rest were delivered today. The pandemic has forced the cancellation of the HPV vaccine program in schools this year. And now clinicians are worried that will lead to an increased risk of cancer for grade sevens. But as Kimberly Molina tells us, there are efforts underway to make sure this year's kids don't fall through the cracks. Grade 7 students normally get two doses of the HPV vaccine, one in the fall and another in the spring. But when schools shut down across Ontario last spring, most students didn't get their second dose. And now a new group of students are at risk of missing their first. That worries some physicians. We don't want people to slip through the cracks and find out years later that they were supposed to get a second shot and never got it. They're entitled to it. It's paid for by public health. And we want to protect boys and girls against the various cancers that HPV causes. The Canadian Cancer Society says three in four Canadians will be infected with HPV. And most HPV-related cancers happen in other parts of the body, outside the cervix. Those cancers can include everything from anal cancer to mouth and throat cancers. And the risk of getting various cancers goes up if someone isn't vaccinated or if they get vaccinated over the age of 15. Brown says women are 88% less likely to get cervical cancer if vaccinated, but it could also take decades after being infected before the cancer appears. And she says removing in-school vaccinations mean many students will miss the crucial vaccine, putting them at greater risk. Do we know which students are going to have a family doctor or which students don't? Are they going to come to their family doctor? Is it going to be something their parents are able to do or perhaps not as not done as easily? Will the doctors have the vaccine? Will things be on time? There's, there's just so many variables that inevitably we see decreased uptake. 
In Ottawa alone, some 10,000 boys and girls in grade 7 take part in the in-school vaccination program. Ottawa Public Health was offering catch-up clinics throughout the summer to any student who had missed a vaccine. But that program has now been put on hold so it can focus on distributing the flu vaccine. Whether the HPV vaccine is being offered in schools this year depends on the local health unit. Some regions like London have plans to offer the vaccine in school, while others say students need to schedule an appointment with their family doctor or at a community clinic. Kimberly Molina, CBC News, Ottawa. After the break, a look at your forecast for the week, plus discovering history through a rare musical find. <laughs> This cello came to me during the quarantine. This has given me something to be very excited about during COVID.
Meteorologist Colette Kennedy joins us now. And Colette, I'm living a little bit in the past year, but I am hopeful for a repeat of that weather we saw in Toronto on Saturday. <laughs> yes, we had some beautiful conditions. That high temperature tie you up to 22 degrees. So I don't know if we're going to quite get there, but we are going to see a few days where those readings are definitely going to be above seasonal. So we do have that to look forward to. And speaking of above seasonal, hey, on Thanksgiving, easy to be thankful when the high today in winds are up to almost, almost 25 degrees. London, beautiful day as well, up to nearly 20. Sarnia, you can still see hanging on to readings like that. Chatham can as well. Some cooler readings towards eastern Ontario and certainly into northern Ontario as well. So very different conditions because we've got this cold front that's coming in, bringing in not just rain, but some thunderstorms. And in some of those downpours, some very heavy rains we've been seeing around Lake Superior and some amounts where they've been seeing up to 50 millimeters. That's why there have been some rainfall warning special weather statements here. And what you're looking at over here, the remnants of what was Hurricane Delta, that would have pushed further north towards the lower Great Lakes if it weren't for this front that's coming in. It's going to kind of sweep through, push everything eastward. So in some ways, that is somewhat helpful. But all of this is going to be riding from west to east through the overnight hours tonight. So it does mean we're likely going to have not just some rain, but some thunderstorms rolling through the GTA through the overnight a little bit lingering in the early morning hours, but then clearing out and setting up for some sunshine coming in through much of the day on Tuesday. You just have to wait for it. So coming in first through southwestern Ontario, this evening and overnight, and then eventually making its way into eastern Ontario. So it's going to be later tomorrow afternoon when you get your clearing there and see the sun coming back out. So late in the day on Tuesday. Overnight tonight, looks like this for your temperatures then with some breezy conditions as those winds will eventually turn to the northwest once the front passes through and then tomorrow afternoon we are looking at those winds letting up the sun coming out so not like today with the high temperatures but still some decent readings there back towards London and towards Windsor tonight very mild temperatures until the front goes through and then tomorrow again it is going to be a nice afternoon the winds eventually letting up there as well and then Kingston tonight 12 degrees for your low 9 degrees for the nation's capital 14 for your high and clearing you just have to wait for it once the sun comes out 16 for Kingston tomorrow this is back towards the GTA Wednesday 17 18 with rain on Thursday I want you to know at the end of the week Talia colder air comes in and north of the city there could even be some flurries into the nighttime hours but that's a few days off so your <laughs> mild days are going to be here first you get those first all right I'll focus on that thanks Colette yeah you're welcome the weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train.
The pandemic has been a tough go for many professional musicians who have had to pause playing live performances. But Toronto cellist Beth Silver found an unexpected joy during this time. She recently acquired an old instrument and discovered a bit about its history. A lot of instruments have a beautiful and amazing history, but I'm fortunate enough to have learned about this cello's history. This cello came to me during the quarantine, or right after lockdown actually. In May, a family friend had called and asked if I would take a look at a cello and if I wanted to play it. Uh, when I saw the cello, I was, I was like completely in awe. I thought it was one of the most beautiful cellos I've ever seen. And it just looked like some ancient prop from Lord of the Rings or something like that. And so far in our research, we found that it has come from the late 1700s or early 1800s. That's when it was made, um, suspected by um, a very fine craftsman. And the cello was restored in the early 19, 1900s by Janos Toth and his daughter Teresa Toth. Teresa later, later went on to starting her own luthier shop in Italy. She was one of the first women to become a, f you know, a famous luthier. Um, and she only apprenticed with her father for three years from 1916 to 1919. And um, her father, Janos Toth, was a really well-known luthier in Budapest at the time. And his story is actually quite sad. He was arrested by the Nazis in uh, 1943 for trading lives. And they, he was sent to Mauthausen, and he died in 1944 there. And now he's listed as one of the righteous among the nations at Yad Vashem. That was all I knew until I brought it to Heinel, and then they took off the top, they removed the top of the instrument, and they said that there was an inscription in Latin, and it said something about sending you off to the world, which is really beautiful. And the luthier who had written it was, it was another Hungarian luthier who had actually also apprenticed with Toth. Um, but that was in the 30s, so they think that the top is a different, is by a different luthier than the rest of the cello. The family friend who called was the family of my mother's first husband. That's not my father. But, he, and he unfortunately died before I had a chance to meet him. But the cello was brought over to Canada by his father, who was sort of um, of Hungarian nobility descent. And he had escaped Hungary when the Iron t Curtain came in. And he managed to, he strapped himself to a train, actually. He strapped himself to underneath a train using his belt, apparently. And then once he was safe in Vienna, he, he managed to got the, get the cello sent to him. And uh, once he had the cello, which must have gotten passed down in his family because it is a Hungarian instrument. Um, and he was an amateur cellist and he brought it. He was, he had a life in Canada. He played on his cello. There are supposedly all of these records, which I'd like to hear as soon as they're found, of him playing with a piano trio he put together in Canada. After Gabor died, his wife kept it in a closet and nobody had played it for 50 years, about 50 years, and they just brought it out in 2020. This has given me something to be very excited about during COVID. Just something to look forward to every day. I look forward to playing by myself in my, in my studio. By